Do the miniseries his way. Is Silent Night, Deadly Night coming back to a theater near you? Has Matt Dillon found the perfect role? Will cement be strong enough to hold the bionic woman? Entertainment Tonight gives Friday, December 14th, 1984. It's just desserts. Easiest cake, huh? I'm Rob Weller. And I'm Mary Hart. All those reports about the demise of Silent Night, Deadly Night, the movie in which the killer is dressed as Santa, may have been premature. Scott Osborne has the story in our news studio. After protests of many theaters showing the movie, TriStar Pictures pulled the film and put it on the shelf. But today, the film's producer, Ira Barmack, told us he has retrieved distribution rights and he plans to re-release Silent Night, Deadly Night after Christmas. Given the sensitivities that have surfaced, I would prefer that it not be released anymore until after the Christmas holidays, that it be no longer associated with Christmas as a Christmas release, and that it be re-released domestic theatrical as, as what it is, a kind of a send-up of a holiday after the fact. Much of the controversy over the film surfaced when parents saw TV ads they found objectionable. Barmack says he was against that advertising strategy from the beginning. It is possible that kids who did not hear the disclaimers would have seen Santa Claus, or someone dressed as Santa Claus, in the context of something frightening. There is no way to defend that. There is no way to justify it. I can only tell you as a historical fact I was against advertising this on television. Though Barmack hopes to put the film back in theaters early next year, he concedes it's not a film for everyone. I think it will always be a battle between the people who understand why this picture is a send-up, and those who on the face of it are going to be offended by it. And I would urge the people who don't, who have the slightest sensitivity on the subject, don't see it. Trade paper reports today say Barmack will try to release Silent Night, Deadly Night on the West Coast before Christmas, but Barmack told us he doesn't think he has enough time to do that. He also refused to detail specific terms of his deal with TriStar. Rob? Thank you, Scott. Another high-level Hollywood studio move, lots of those in 84. Gary Hendler has resigned as President and Chief Operating Officer of TriStar Pictures. Hendler said he would form his own production company and TriStar would be its distributor. Boxing promoter Don King, who also promoted the Jackson Victory Tour, yesterday was indicted on 23 counts of income tax evasion. The federal indictment alleges violations between 1978 and 1982. And Michael Jackson, star of the Victory Tour, had a homecoming of sorts in Los Angeles. While filming a Pepsi commercial earlier this year, he was injured in an accident and was subsequently treated for burns at the Brotman Medical Center in Culver City. In appreciation of his treatment there, both Jackson and Pepsi are donating an undisclosed amount of money to the Burn Center, which has been renamed the Michael Jackson Burn Center. He joined Pepsi President Roger Enrico at a press conference to make the announcement. Michael hugged his doctors and posed in front of a big brass plaque, which will display his name at the Burn Center. Apart from that, he was relatively speechless. All he offered was a simple... Thank you. Frank Sinatra put in a rare appearance yesterday at a news conference called to promote a miniseries about his life. Alan Arthur was there. Well, I don't think it's a matter of clearing anything up. I just think it's a matter of doing what, I, what happened to me in my lifetime, or most of it. And then the people can decide for themselves whether what they read was right or what we're saying is right, or what we're doing is right. Audiences will be able to decide for themselves when the life story of Francis Albert Sinatra is brought to television. The six-hour miniseries is scheduled to air on CBS during the 1986-87 television season, and it's going to be produced by someone who knows Mr. Sinatra very well. Tina Sinatra, youngest daughter of Old Blue Eyes, will shoulder that responsibility. This is going to be painful, I want to tell you. We'll fight and we'll cry and we'll complain to each other and argue, but... Um... The commitment is made. He knows if he doesn't do it, someone else will, and we have to tell the truth or it won't be good. One of the continuing misconceptions Frank Sr. aims to clear up in this TV biography is his feeling about the press. I'm not angry with the press. I'm angry with certain members of the press, not the press. As to questions about who will play the lead role, daughter Tina will only speculate. Well, if David Bowie weren't English... <laughs> Alan Arthur, Entertainment Tonight. 
Today kicks off one of the biggest movie opening weekends of the year with six new films entering the competition for your holiday box office dollar. They are Dune with Kyle MacLachlan and Sting, Francis Coppola's Cotton Club with Richard Gere, Diane Lane and Gregory Hines, Starman with Jeff Bridges and Karen Allen, Runaway starring Tom Selleck and Gene Simmons, Mass Appeal with Jack Lemmon goes into limited release, and British director David Lean returns to filmmaking for the first time in 14 years for The Passage to India. Gene Wolfe reports on its celebrity screening last night. A Passage to India, based on E.M. Forster's classic novel, has finally made it to the screen. And it marks the return to filmmaking by David Lean after a 14-year absence. You've long held a fascination for India. Why is that? I just like it. I've been there many, many times. I've always wanted to make a film about it, and here it is. When I first saw Mrs. Moore, it was in the moonlight. I thought she was a ghost. <laughs> the film stars Victor Banerjee, Alec Guinness, and Judy Davis in a drama about heavy-handed British colonial rule in India, a country which is full of sharp contrasts. It's a whole different kind of way of life, of civilization. Lots of images of people, uh, lots of people. A lot of sadness, a lot of, um, a lot of poverty, and a lot of struggling to survive. I hope the film will help give some kind of relief to the people who are suffering, or at least are, are sharing the suffering of us Indians, and will thereby encourage a movement towards India. Gene Wolfe, Entertainment Tonight. Some good news today for Lone Ranger fans who had trouble recognizing Clayton Moore with his mask off. Moore, who had to make do recently with sunglasses, had been prohibited from appearing as the Lone Ranger. Well, the Rather Corporation, which had sued Moore, causing the sunglasses for mask switch, has dropped charges. Moore can now go anywhere he wants as the Lone Ranger. And in New York, another week of testimony is on record with the Westmoreland versus CBS libel trial. Dixie Watley filed this update report. Despite Westmoreland's attorney Dan Burt's efforts to the contrary, the CBS team won a major victory this week. Judge Pierre Laval blocked admission of major portions of the so-called Benjamin Report, CBS's in-house investigation of the documentary. The report, ordered by CBS when Westmoreland criticized the broadcast, faulted producer George Cryle for violating certain CBS policies. While CBS ultimately concluded the broadcast was accurate, many felt some of the report would cast both CBS and Cryle in a poor light. Judge Laval decided against admitting the report because much of it had nothing to do with the issues of the trial. While Westmoreland's attorney, Dan Bird won't have the Benjamin report to work with, he's used just about every other weapon against Cryle. Pointing his finger and often raising his voice, Burt has accused Kreil of destroying research that supported Westmoreland, of coaching witnesses, and even of fabricating entire incidents. Throughout the week, Kreil has calmly repeated that he did nothing wrong and assured Burt that future witnesses will support both him and the documentary. Kreil's testimony will continue next week. Dixie Watley, Entertainment Tonight. Here are this week's top five pop singles. New Edition is fifth with their first top of the charts hit, Cool It Now. The Honey Drippers, featuring Led Zeppelin's Robert Plant, are fourth with Sea of Love. Hall & Oates are next with Out of Touch. Holding on to second place is Duran Duran with The Wild Boys. And at the top of the pop singles chart, Madonna with Like a Virgin. We'll have a look at the video version later in the show. Coming up next, Ilya Baskin, a Russian emigre, gets an American dream come true in 2010. And ahead, Matt Dillon, the Flamingo Kid, goes on location in Australia. Russian-born actor Elia Baskin has put the accent on work since coming to America, and the result, reports Alan Arthur, it's been a year any card-carrying member of the Screen Actors Guild would be proud of. Easy as cake, huh? Pie. Easy as pie. Call it typecasting. Playing the Russian cosmonaut in 2010 is former Soviet citizen Ilya Baskin, a successful actor with the Moscow Art Theater who left Russia in 1976 when the Soviets relaxed immigration rules for Jews. But the idea that he would play in a big Hollywood film seemed as far away as the moons of Jupiter. I remember I saw 2001 back in Russia in 19... Uh, I think it was 1971. It was 
beautiful film then and uh, it was so far away and if at that time somebody would tell me that you would be in the sequel in the next film I would think that this person needs to see a doctor or something and here I am the road however from the Moscow Art Theater to the sound stages of Hollywood was not an easy one at one point I decided to give acting up because uh, it was too painful to waiting for the phone to ring and nothing was happening. So I decided that uh, that's something I have to think about and uh, maybe I should quit it and find something else to do. So on another Soviet emigre, Alexander Polowitz asked Baskin to help start the Russian language newspaper Panorama. Baskin jumped at the chance. When we started, there was only three of us who was working, who was making this paper. And so I was a photographer, I was a writer, I was a publisher, I was a layout artist, I mean, everything. It was a very interesting and exciting thing. Let's practice our English. Okay. Okay? Okay. Let us practice. Baskin's lucky break came with Moscow on the Hudson. Playing a Russian who's resolved to defect fails him at the last moment. In Moscow on the Hudson, uh, Anatoly the Clown was dreaming about defecting because there wasn't uh, any way, any other way out for him. In my case, I, I left legally. If you remember, uh, starting uh, early 70s, uh, the time of detente, when lucky people who had relatives abroad could leave country. And uh, we all were afraid that it wouldn't last too long. So I used this chance to just leave the Soviet Union, not knowing what will be ahead of me. With Moscow on the Hudson and now 2010, 1984 has been a big year for you. Is America all you thought it would be? A little bit more. I didn't realize how much opportunity one can have if he has the determination to do things. The $41 million Dino De Laurentiis science fiction epic Dune finally landed on Earth today. I don't know if Leonard Malton has recovered from the ride, but he is here nonetheless with his review. until no Harkonnen breathes Arakeen air. Dune, a world beyond your experience, beyond your imagination. Let me tell you, this film is not only beyond my imagination, it's beyond my comprehension. Let me try explaining it to you. The Messiah of the Fremen on the planet Arrakis is in actuality the son of the House of Atreides from the planet Caladan but he's being sent to combat the Harkonnens by the Padishah Emperor while he's mining the precious melange. Now, he shouldn't have been born at all, according to the Reverend Mother, but now he's going to become the Kwisatz Haderach as he tries to fight the giant worm on Arrakis. There'll be a quiz. Pay attention. What's that you're saying? Nothing. Right. You want special effects? You got special effects. You want disgusting characters? You got disgusting characters. You want a lot of gobbledygook? There's enough here to last a lifetime. Now, I know that Frank Herbert's Dune books are very popular, but I can only judge this movie, and it's so frustrating, because all that money and all that imagination add up to a giant exercise in boredom and confusion. This movie is the celluloid equivalent of Somonex. So let me use my powers as a film reviewer to transmit my innermost thoughts to you. Save your money and your time and read a good book instead. Maybe even Dune. I'm giving this movie a three. I'm Leonard Malton, Entertainment Tonight. Well, we'll have Movie Tracks report on Dune and the other movies opening today next week. For those of you who are planning to join the Christmas rush to the movies this weekend, here's how audiences on both coasts graded six recently opened films and what Movie Track has to say about their financial future. Falling in Love was given a B- by ticket buyers, and Movie Track said falling will stumble at the box office. City Heat also received a B-, and Movie Track predicted it will not make the Christmas top five list. The Terminator got a grade A and a prediction for a big box office. The Killing Fields, now in limited release, was given an A, and Movie Track said it will do very well at the box office once it's opened around the rest of the country. 2010 was given an A- minus by ticket buyers, and Movie Track predicted it will be a big buck earner. Beverly Hills Cop also got an A-, and Movie Track said it'll be the film to beat at the holiday box office. 
And Lindsay Wagner gets an unusual gift from her fans, that when we return. What's up with Gregory Harrison and Randy Oaks? What's going on on The Young and the Restless? Bill Harris tells it all inside entertainment. Bill? Thank you, Mary. From our carbon copy department, ABC plans a pilot titled Beverly Hills Station. This original idea centers around a comedic look at Beverly Hills cops and crime. You can bet it will not star Eddie Murphy. On and off the ailing list, Jack Wagner was off General Hospital this week. He's been suffering from a bad back. And Alex Trebek was out sick last week with an attack of kidney stones. Happy to report he's back hosting Jeopardy. The problem has passed. From our Couples on the Move department, next Wednesday night, Trapper John's Gregory Harrison and actress Randy Oakes repeat their marriage vows before a gathering of their Hollywood friends. It's a public celebration of their three-and-a-half-year-old secret marriage, which came to light earlier this year. And finally, the young and the restless daytime star Phil Morris, son of Mission Impossible's Greg Morris, tackles a pretty big mission himself next month. For a new storyline, the young black star will go undercover and be turned white. And they say nothing ever changes in Hollywood. Bill Harris, Inside Entertainment, we'll talk again. Rob? Thank you, Bill. CBS won the daytime Nielsen Derby last week with an average rating of 6.5. Top show honors, however, went to ABC's General Hospital with an average of 9.1. And ABC has announced plans to reshuffle its prime time lineup with seven new series to bow in the first three months of 85. TV's bionic woman who bit the cancellation bullet this season when ABC shelved her new show, Jesse, had a very nice day in Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome to the Walk of Fame, Miss Lindsay Wagner. Yeah! The thing that made Lindsay Wagner's star ceremony a little different was the presence of dedicated fan club members who not only came from far away, but who have even named their children after her. I'm holding Lindsay. She's very tired because we travel 2,700 miles from West Virginia. I came all the way from New Jersey to see Lindsay get her star because she, she deserves to get her star because she's the most talented actress around. She's a well-known face and a well-known actress, and it's about time after all these years she finally gets one. Lindsay's star came about because her fan club petitioned to have it put on the Walk of Fame and paid for it, too. It was their gift to her and one she appreciated. It's so thrilling. I'm so touched that I've been able to, to please you. Their love and their dedication was that they put it into action. And uh, they wanted to have, they wanted to give something back to me. I mean, that was really nice. That is very unusual, and as I understand, a star costs about $3,000. Yeah, $3,000 and nearly 3,000 miles for some of those people. Long way, lots of dedication. When we come back, a down-under look at a young star on top, Matt Dillon. Coming up this weekend, all new on Entertainment This Week, Shirley MacLaine. Was she a dancer and a harem in a previous life? Rick Dees, Life at Home is lively for radio and television's new hot personality. Dudley Moore, in London with the serious man behind the comic performances. All this weekend, all new on Entertainment This Week. Time now for the E.T. Digest for Friday, the 14th of December. On tour, Smokey Robinson at the Beverly Theater in Beverly Hills and Cheetah Rivera at the Tropicana Hotel in Atlantic City. New in the record store, an album, Bop to Wop from Manhattan Transfer. New in the video store, Start the Revolution Without Me with Gene Wilder and Donald Sutherland. And Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, also starring Gene Wilder. And celebrating birthdays today, Patty Duke Aston is 38, Lee Remick, 49, Abby Lane, George Firth, and Charlie Rich are all 52, and Maury Amsterdam is 70. Ever since his movie debut five years ago as the young tough in Over the Edge, Matt Dillon has been making movie critics stand up and take notice. But it's not movie reviews that matter to the young star, as Dixie Watley discovered when she talked to him recently on location in Australia. Aspic, Jeffrey. Mother, I don't really think Jeffrey knows what Aspic is. No, I don't. In Flamingo Kid, Matt Dillon plays a street-smart Brooklyn youth who finds himself thrown into the world of a ritzy Long Island beach club. Dillon is an actor who goes where the good roles are, including a recent journey to Australia, where he played an American soldier gone AWOL during World War II in a film with the working title of Rebel. He found filmmaking down under a bit different. 
Yeah, they take these tea breaks, which they don't do in the States, so it's nice, you know, you can catch a, a second, third wind. I really like it here. I mean, it's not like I'm in uh, Siberia or something. Yeah, it's, a, it's a nice country. But, um, uh, yeah, I get homesick. Just, you know, sometimes just being white, you know, but I can get like that. See, I'm from New York, you know, I could get like that if I'm making a movie in Chicago, you know. He has no difficulty playing a wide range of characters on screen. But like many actors, his off-screen personality is more guarded. Two of the most difficult things are getting what you want and not getting what you want. You know, and I think I can apply that to myself sometimes. If I want something, then I get it. But then all of a sudden, I've had that. What next? You know, it's a matter of always being hungry, which is good to a certain degree. It can also be, you know, not so good. Do you ever worry that it's just never going to be enough, that you'll never be completely satisfied? That's always the case. You, know, you can never be completely satisfied. Can you? I can't. Well, Monday on Entertainment Tonight, Mary Lou Henner talks about her new film, Johnny Dangerously. And Doug Sheehan talks about life on Knott's Landing. And just a reminder, don't forget to join Rob and Lisa Gibbons this weekend for another edition of Entertainment This Week. We're going to leave you today with a look at the number one song in the country. As we told you, Madonna's Like a Virgin. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.